Herkese merhaba. Bugün Evrim Ağacı Canlı Bilim serisinde kendimizi aşarak enfes bir konuğu ağırlayacağız. Manchester Üniversitesi Fizik ve Astronomi bölümünden Profesör Brian Cox bizimle birlikte olacak. Brian Cox'u hepinizin tanıdığını az çok tahmin ediyorum. Çünkü kendisi tıpkı Carl Sagan gibi uzun yıllar boyunca harika belgeseller çekmiş ve bilime yaptığı katkılarla David Attenborough gibi birinin ben taşıdığım bayrağı bundan sonra Brian Cox'a devretmek istiyorum dediği gerçekten çok önemli bir isim. Ve bugün bu canlı yayını yapıyor olmamızın özel bir nedeni de var. Çünkü genellikle kendilerini stand-up'tan tanıdığınız Tuz Biber ekibi Brian Cox'un meşhur Horizons şovunu 19 Nisan 2024 günü saat 20.30'da Tim Show Center'a getiriyor. Bu bilim iletişimine, bilim anlatıcılığına bambaşka bir bakış açısı sunan benim hiç görmediğim, daha önce daha doğrusu Brian Cox'a kadar görmediğim e, müthiş bir şov. Sadece bir bilim anlatısı, bir bilim dersinden ibaret değil, dev LED ekranlarda sunulan, ve Brian Cox'un anlatımıyla sizi bir bilim yolculuğuna çıkaran bir deneyim aslında. Ben de burada Dallas'taki şovuna gelmiştim yıllar önce. Hatta birazdan kendisine de bahsedeceğim. Benim oğlum o zaman iki aylıktı ve onu da götürmüştük. Muhtemelen en genç konuğu olacak. Birazdan buna gireceğim. Şimdi tüm detayları vermeyeyim ama. Ve... Gerçekten benim de bilim iletişimine bakışımı değiştirdi. Dolayısıyla bugün daha da fazla bekletmeden kendisini Brian Cox'la hem yeni şovunu hem bilime bilim iletişimine bakış açısını hem de Türkiye'ye neler getirmek istediğini neler göstereceğini birazcık konuşmak istiyorum. Dolayısıyla daha fazla bekletmeden onu sahneye alayım. Bu arada konuşmamızın alt yazılarını aşağıdan görebileceksiniz. Hiç merak etmeyin. İngilizce konuşuyor olsak bile anlık alt yazıları aşağıdan okuyabileceksiniz. E, ve daha fazla uzatmadan kendisini hemen davet ediyorum. Evet. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Cox. Um, I actually want to open uh, by thanking you for being such an inspiration uh, to all of us, the science communicators. And like we were talking just a moment ago, uh, my wife and I were at your Horizon show in Dallas last year in June. And in fact, our son uh, was two months old at the time, and he was there too. <laughs> so yeah. we might be holding <laughs> the record for the youngest yeah. science audience member of your shows. I don't know. Maybe there's an even younger one somewhere, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but joke aside, it was an incredible show you put together with Robert Enns and the animations, images, jokes, uh, they were all really captivating. Uh, I wonder how you come up with these ideas for these sh science shows, because, you know, I have to say they're pretty original for science communication. Like, how is that creative process? It it's it's a good question and i think about it a lot because i also think about the next one you know when whenever that may be <laughs> 2026 yeah. or something but the the answer is that things you know uh, things it's things that interest me that um in particular the in the show there's a, there's quite a lot about black holes because i'm interested mm -hmm. in black holes i've recently written a book on it i have a phd student working in that area And so it's it's rapidly moving science that I think is is potentially very profound, and so th that's that's that's interesting. But then the, the the the really fun bit for me in creating a show is to find a way of weaving those ideas together because I'm also interested in the origin of the universe. There's more since you last saw the show actually. Um, it, it's changed. There's there's some more biology in the show. I've got more and more interested in the origin of life as a potential research subject that is cool so, so, yes so there's more research uh, and also um i did a version of the show um uh, just before christmas at sydney opera house with the sydney symphony orchestra and that changed oh, a lot it, it changed uh, it was it was a discussion between the, this great music and um, ricard strauss and Mahler and sibelius which is in the show so sibelius starts the show Uh, these great composers wow. of the past and the ideas that we that are raised by astronomy and cosmology and so I, i'm always changing as i as i get interested in different things or, or see different stories i would like to tell or explore myself actually ideas so we kind of evolve over time then huh i do it we can 
So it's partly part of it's rather experimental. So sometimes I'm As. wandering onto the stage thinking, you know, if if there's if there are three thousand people in the audience or whatever it is, and I'm I'm talking to them, I better maybe I'll come up with some ideas. <laughs> when I'm there, you know. That is that is awesome. And you will be visiting Turkey for the first time, is that right? I like mean, ever, once, I meant not once, for the show. Have you ever been to Turkey before? Once before, and but it was for it was for one day, and I was busy. I, I was giving a talk actually, but it was a talk. Um, so uh, it wasn't a public talk. It was a, a kind of a you know talk at a conference. Academic. Okay. And so, so I've never seen the seen Istanbul. I, I've never, and, and everyone oh. I know who's been there has said it's the most wonderful city. So I've got some time off. We planned the tour. Actually, I said to my promoter, right, I'm having at least a day off in in this. Yes, I, that's what. I, well, <laughs> that won't be enough. I can tell. I, I can guess, assure yeah. you that. But at least I'm glad you'll you will see the city because I bet that will impact you, and maybe it will make it to your show. What you see, how it makes you feel, because yeah. it's such a such a deep history. So I'm glad you'll you will uh, get to see it uh, maybe for a day, but. Um, so what type of a show are you planning for us? Like, can you give us an overview of it maybe since, you know, I won't be able to give a good overview since you said it's, it's changed already in two yeah. years. So, so it's, it's pretty cool. It's, yeah. So the, the way the, the show works, it was conceived actually for huge venues, arenas. So we, we, we did the show in, in very big. So the, the O2 arena here in London, you know, it's 14, 15,000 people. So it's based around very big LED screens and very big graphics. And that's what you'll see. So as much LED as we can fit in, we'll be in. So, yeah. uh, and it's a mixture of it. We, I start actually with this, this idea I'd had, which is partly why it's called a, a, a 21st century space odyssey. It's yeah. an idea about not only cosmology and exploring the nature of space and time and black holes and so on, but exploring our place in the universe, what, what, how we came to be the way that we are and what we might become. So there's a sense of 2001 in that. You know, so there yes. are images um, created by a great artist called Eric Bernquist, actually, who's based in Stockholm, images of a possible human future. At least that's the way I interpret these images. And so it's a sort of, you, you'll see this film at the start, which is set to Sibelius's Fifth Symphony, which is this remarkable piece of music. It's, it's the foundation of virtually every science fiction film theme you've ever heard. Like every computer yeah. borrowed from Sibelius's Fifth Symphony, I think. <laughs> you hear them all in that, Probably, possibly, yeah. It was written in 1915 in Finland. Right? Wow. So it's, it's a magnificent thing. So you see this film and it sets up this, idea of, of we're going to explain or, or try to explore as best we can what our reality is so really I, it's remarkable that the study of black holes is fo forcing us forcing us to ask questions about the nature of space and time which might not have occurred to us otherwise it's, how, why would you ask the question what is time you know you might say it's a for, a, for a space object right <laughs> but yeah, you have space. to it's the arena yeah. in which we live yeah it's might there's a bit more to it than that it turns out and so we're led to, I think you, you are immediately when you think about cosmology and fundamental physics and black holes, you're led to questioning our place in it all. So you're led to questions about how did we come to be here? What's our value? Are we insignificant or valuable? Yeah. But, and those are the questions that we end up exploring in the show. That's what I really liked about it. First of all, the, the screen in Dallas too like changed my view of science communication for sure immediately because that was one of the most fabulous things I've ever seen. And uh, and it wasn't even that big probably when compared to some others that you have uh, put it'll on. Be bigger in, uh, it'll be bigger in Istanbul. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. That's, yeah, I, I know. We tend to go big when we <laughs> do this thing. So uh, I bet that will be even, even more fabulous. Um, but also the philosophy behind it, and it makes you think it, it, it's not just like a lecture of science. It's also there's deep philosophy in it and and definitely art, which I'll come come back to it in a, in a bit. But um, so uh, we, this is a kind of a new thing in uh, the world of science, of course, in quotation marks new. But um, 
especially new in Turkey. So you are a science communicator as well as a scientist. And as you may well know, there's a this thing called the Sagan effect, especially in astrophysics. I want to kind of switch gears here and ask about, you know, some academics or some elitist academics, maybe I should say, used to think that the, you know, science shouldn't be too accessible to the masses. You know, according to them, a scientist should not spend his or her valuable time on the popularization of science. You know, Carl Sagan may not be the first one to go against this, you know, <laughs> part of my language, BS claim, uh, but he surely was the most influential one. So what do you say to those types of critics? Uh, have you ever been criticized for doing what you do outside the realm of uh, science? Um, I, I, not really. Um, I think that when, when Carl Sagan was working, the, the, there was a significantly bigger problem, I think. Um, can you hear that, by the way? Someone's driving a very loud thing past my um, window. So I'll, <laughs> we can. I'll, uh, There's no... Uh, it's it loud go. and clear. No problem at all. And then I will answer, yeah. <laughs> Your it's microphone's done. doing a great job. Okay, I okay, right, okay. So if, if you go back to when Carl Sagan was working, certainly in the 1980s, I think there was a real prejudice against scientists mm -hmm. in science. Um, he answered it very eloquently, and, and, and I share the same view, and it's this. It's a simple idea, several ideas. One is that our civilization is built, at least in part, on science. It is one of the foundations of our civilization. Um, and we all participate, of course, in our civilization. Each of us, everyone uh, participates in the direction that our countries and our world will go. It's, it's part of our collective choice as individuals. And if the majority of people have no understanding or, or, or just don't know what we've discovered and also, crucially, don't know how this knowledge was acquired, this reliable knowledge about nature, then we don't really have a chance of building a better future because it's so important. Whether we like it or not, it's not a choice. You know, obviously, we all know this deep down. It's not only the technology that we use, not only, you know, phones and, and medical technology and satellites and the, the way we're talking about the internet, all those things. It's not only that, of course. It's, it's questions about how do we deal with pandemics? How do we deal with the challenges of climate change? How do we deal with the threats of nuclear weapons and things, all those things. The, these, these things require everybody, as many people as possible, to have an appreciation or an understanding of how we come to a judgment about how do we know that burning too many fossil fuels will begin to affect the climate? How do we, how do we, how do we know how to... But construct a vaccine against the next pandemic, which is inevitably coming. What should we do to make sure that we are better equipped? That that, that requires not every every. Of course, everybody doesn't have time to understand in detail the science, or may not even care so much about it. But I think the more people that understand what science is, the better. So that's number one. It's it's a political point essentially, but there's also the point that. We all fund this to a larger, greater or lesser extent, right? A lot of taxpayers' money goes into science. And, and what you're doing... So the, the wonderful discoveries that are made, not only the ones that you might say are useful at the moment and going to technology and so on, but the wonderful things we've discovered, like black holes, for example, the idea that it seems that, that, that according to Einstein, time ends inside a black hole. There are two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. The beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope and all those things. These are all our common heritage, right? They're, they're, we, we all own it, this knowledge. It's been all generated on the back of everybody, it, it, it, whether you look at it as taxpayers' money or you can look at it as if, if you're a farmer, then you grew the food that the scientist ate, right? It's a collective endeavor, right? So, yes. so I think everybody has a right to to to yeah. get to experience the joy. And we, we mustn't forget that, you know, for all its tremendous usefulness and for all that we could talk a bit maybe later about this, the way that science makes you think, it's also very useful. Robert Oppenheimer, Richard Feynman thought about that in detail, but just so I don't go on forever, there's just a tremendous joy. <laughs> So it's it's not only not a burden, 
it's a, it's it's a responsibility for scientists to communicate what they're doing to the to the public. You, would you agree with that? Yes, it, absolutely. Yeah. But for for all those reasons, some of them are practical. Yeah. Some of them are just a responsibility because it's the public. The public own it, right? We yes. all own this. So that why is, should only a few people uh, enjoy it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's that's for sure. Um, so. I uh, watched this one clip uh, from the Friday night with Jonathan Ross from 2010 that you were a part That's of. Really good, yeah. And over there, <laughs> you mentioned that you got a D from maths. Yeah. Um, and now <laughs> you are such an influential scientist and a science communicator that Sir David Attenborough had said that he wants to pass the baton to you. What an honor that must be. <laughs> I can't even yeah. uh, ima imagine. So how does a student with these from math become such a successful scientist and a science communicator? I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I learned a really valuable lesson at university. So I was lucky that when I did my exams, then I took a few years out to be a musician and I came back. And even though I'd, so I'd done well in physics, I got an A in physics, and the, but I got this D in maths and partly because I didn't work hard enough at school. So I just, I was interested in other things in music as well. And I didn't put the work in. And so I was very lucky that Manchester University took a chance and said, well, you should have got a better grade really, but we'll let you in. And, and I learned that you have to do some work sometimes. So, so it, and I say this to a lot of students and, and when they talk to me and say, well, you know, how do you become a scientist? Well, and, and, and a lot of it is being curious and interested and excited about the ideas, but there's also going to be some work involved. And by the time I got to university, when I was 23 or 24, I was ready for it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to work at this because I want to understand it. And then I saw the beauty in it when I, I it took me a while to see the beauty in mathematics. And I'm still not brilliant. You know, I'm not the, somehow some naturally gifted mathematician. Very, very few scientists are, right? Most, yeah, I was going to say most scientists aren't. That's it's a big really misconception not. among the public, too, that you have to be a Einstein to be a scientist. Ninety-nine percent yeah. of science isn't done by Einsteins. <laughs> that wonderful story, isn't it, about Einstein when he said at a school, he, he was talking, and he said, you know, when I was your age, I was no Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, wow that is that is deep actually i didn't know that that is pretty cool <laughs> and uh like you said you have a pretty unique background in both science and music and for those who don't know professor cox was a keyboard player for a northern irish english pop and dance uh, group called dream and uh, is that how you the dream the dream yeah. it's written, yeah. the re <laughs> it has a cool uh uh styling on it but uh, also before you were, were in other bands too and by the way for again our audience this is not your average garage band because you guys had two studio albums that reached the uk top five so that is something for sure yeah. so i want to ask you how how do you think this blend of art and science influences your approach to communicating you know complex scientific ideas or did it have any impact you think i think it does have an impact because i i I genuinely believe we're, we're, we're science raises very profound questions, which is part of the show. Uh, of course it does. Cosmology and astronomy raise profound questions about our place. So you've got this thing. I often think about it as some kind of central object, whatever it is, the, the truth, right? The, the answer to yes. these, these questions. And, and I very strongly believe that there are different lights that you shine on this thing. And we, we see the shadows. It's the, it's the old Plato's cave idea that we, yes. we're only, mm -hmm. the, the shadows are accessible to us. And, and, and so science is a necessary light and you see the shadow. It gives us a framework. We have to, you, you can't understand what, our, what, what it means to be human without knowing how big the universe is or how old the universe is. Of course you need that. But then there's music, which is a different, way of approaching the great challenge of existence right it, I, Marla Marla's in the show a bit the bit of Marla and he famously said that if, if he'd have been able to express in words what he's expressing in music he wouldn't have written the music <laughs> right so yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the, these are different ways of thinking that yeah, add sure. up if, if you put them together 
and, and shine those different lights on these questions, you get many different shadows and you have more chance of getting a deeper understanding. I, I firmly believe that. So, so it's not all about, um, for me, it never has been all about just finding things out about the world. There is that underlying question is what to make of it? What do I make of this? It's, it's the, what's my reaction to it? How am I supposed to feel about this stuff? You know, and, and that's valid and important, I think. And so that, that's why I've always been interested. I, I, you know, I've, I've had these two strands at least. You know, I've always been interested in music, very interested and, and interested in science. And then late, later, later in life, you know, different kinds of music, philosophy, there's a underpinning the show. There's a couple of quotes. I sometimes mention uh, some Nietzsche said, right, that um, one, mm. one of the reasons he wrote Zarathustra, which is a great piece of music by Richard Strauss, which only everyone knows the first minute, which is the worst bit, which is in 2001, <laughs> which is the, the yeah. least interesting <laughs> bit of that piece. There's 26 minutes of brilliance after that. And some of that's in the show, in the background, you'll hear it. And Nietzsche said, he said, yeah, how can we justify our existence when faced with the unlimited power of nature? Well, that's yeah. interesting, right? How do we justify it? Is, yeah. it's, it's a question that's raised. Well, Strauss had a good attempt at answering it in this music that he wrote so mm. why not so why would we not as a as an experience as a, as a show as a thing that people come to why i want to shine as many lights on these questions as i can yes that and and you are really good at it i have to say and i bet the our audience members will also appreciate it a lot and um also it's hard to uh, think about a lot of scientists without the perspective of music i mean I, einstein is a very obvious one but he's not he's not the only one for sure so um uh, also it kind of goes with that um stereotype where scientists uh can't express them to themselves very well so i guess they try to express uh some of those feelings and in, in music maybe um but i don't well, know if, if, if you said, feel like that. i think it's it's not really it's not kind of a compromise as i said i mean marlow was right yeah. he said you can't express some of these things verbally that yeah. that's why music is, is is as valuable as it is and the visual arts and you know there's things there, these are different ways of trying to express and explore the nature of humanity yeah and uh actually i'm, I'm glad you spoke about uh, visual arts too because the you know science communicating is mainly evolving into that uh, field because you can talk about how how great a black hole is all you want but without seeing it without seeing its effects uh, maybe through animations and simulations uh, no one can really appreciate it other than than physicists i mean uh before interstellar maybe <laughs> you know uh, for the general audience uh, other than some you know uh, basic simulations of black holes, nothing was available. But after Interstellar, things have changed, right? I mean, people now know what it looks like. Um, and <laughs> kinda, it's kind of sad that it even overshadowed the actual <laughs> image of a black hole because how, how well it was de depicted in the movie. Um, so visual arts is definitely impacting how we communicate these ideas too. And, yeah, and I use um, I use them both in in the in the show. So we have the image. I must say, so that we I show the image, the first image of a black hole that was acquired by mm -hmm. a, a black hole in a galaxy called M eighty seven, and that yes. is one of the moments in the show when the audience go very quiet because you're at all this mm -hmm. strange stuff that I've talked about. Suddenly, you're looking at a photograph of it. You know, and yeah. there's something about a real photograph. But mentioning in Stella, I do have this um, two actual simulations of black holes, which were both generated using the computer code that was developed for Interstellar um, by mm -hmm. Kip Thorne, amongst others. Kip Thorne, yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, they, it, they're remarkable simulations. And I, I think I'll always use them in shows, yeah. in part because they cost so much money <laughs> to generate. <laughs> <laughs> it's so expensive because, because of the computer time. Because yeah, they, they, I can't they, even imagine. That yeah. It's called DNGR, the develop, uh, for, developed for Interstellar. And that code ray traces bundles of rays through yeah. the, the, the space time. It's called the metric. It's called the Kerr metric, mm -hmm. uh, the spinning mm -hmm. black 
So it ray traces everything. So every frame you move the camera and it recalculates the paths of all the light rays from all the stars yeah. and the disk of material called the accretion disk around the black hole. So it's a tremendously computer intensive process to generate those things. So I have two of them that we did with, with the graphics company, DNEG, who, who wrote that code for Interstellar with Kit. And, uh, you know, okay. so I love them. They're, they're spectacular. So you'll see those. So we go into orbit around the black hole. And it's not an artist's impression. It's a simulation. It is what general relativity tells us. It yeah. just based it's completely quick. I mean, it's the outcome is just terrific. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure our, our viewers right now, if they uh, are attending. By the way, the show is almost sold out. So this is your last chance to buy the yeah. final. I wonder, you know, few tickets ticket. left. Sometimes you can open up the venues, but I don't know. I, don't, it, I was surprised. I, I, I should say thank you to everybody in, in, in Istanbul and Turkey because I'd know, I've i never done a show there before. And as you said, maybe maybe no one's yeah. tried to do one of these shows there. So no. you know, we, we could have sold 10 tickets. And given that we've got you know, <laughs> sold well, 15 meters of LED or something like that and, and, and yes. some 30 crew, it would have been a bit of a disaster <laughs> if we had sold. That would be interesting. But uh, so that's what's special about Turkey. Um, you will have an audience like you've never had before because that will be a, in quotation marks, hungry audience for science that's why we exist uh, as every major tree of evolution in english um we uh, try to fill that uh, space as much as possible but it's not a one person one team job you know it's just we're lacking the entirety of academic you know uh, wealth of of of the world of course we have very good scientists very good science but you know um this science communication part isn't there yet so this i believe will change the course of uh, science communication in turkey so i have to thank you i can't thank enough uh for doing this as a person who saw the show it's not just a, a lecture we have a lot of lectures that's not a problem you know we have we have hosted all the uh big uh names in science and and little known ones too which contribute to science a lot but um uh, doing something like this in turkey will open up new horizons like the show <laughs> uh, show's name imply uh, in a lot of people and i think that's very valuable so um, on behalf of uh, the people of turkey i i want to thank you for doing this too um, and i think you'll enjoy it because you will not i, I i'm i bet you Hopefully you'll remember this after the show that uh, you will not have had any uh, audience that is so into it, so willing to absorb everything that's coming out of your mouth. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy that too. And um, uh, yeah, so we'll see how how, how it goes. But um, I have a few more questions left before we close. Uh, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time. Um, but um, you are also an um, outspoken critic of uh, politics, as far as I can see, especially on social media. Like you, uh, you put out your opinions, um, which which is what scientists should do. Uh, but in a world increasingly polarized by like different beliefs and ideologies, uh, how do you navigate uh, communicating science as a universal truth? Maybe, um, like, what do you think about us having flat earthers in like 21st century? How do you put these two things together? Uh, how do you navigate that? It's a very good question because um, I think about this a lot because it's obviously it's so easy to just laugh, isn't it? Especially with flat earthers. It is, yeah. <laughs> and I do, yeah. you know, occasionally joke about them. In the show, I have a joke about flat earth. Mm -hmm. But um, ultimately, I've, I've come to think that what we should all be doing is try to, we have to try and, and unify. We, we have to understand that there are, there are people with different views and different opinions and different perspectives. And of course, that's, uh, that's what makes our civilization so rich. And, and so I, I've kind of changed my mind. I, I, I've realized I was influenced by Oppenheimer, actually, um, that he, he gave mm -hmm. Uh, the BBC Wreath Lectures. So the BBC had these things called called the Wreath Lectures. And, and lots of very wonderful people have done them. Stephen Hawking did them recent, relatively recently. But Oppenheimer did them in 53. 
And it was very shortly after the Manhattan Project and very shortly after he clearly felt responsible in part for what happened to yeah. Japan with the bombs falling on Japan. And then, um, so he'd uh, thought about how we can avoid doing that again, because of course we haven't avoided it necessarily. We could destroy ourselves. You know, we could do it now. We could do it tomorrow. Still there, uh, the threat. And and so he, and he said that he had this wonderful analogy of uh, of an electron. And at the time, quantum mechanics was quite new, right? So people were thinking about this electron. Is it a point-like thing, like a little particle? Is it a wavy thing that fills the space that it's in? What is it? And the answer is, of course, it, it's it can behave in both those ways. You need at least both those pictures to understand the thing. And, and more as well. So it's neither one of them's right or wrong. It's it's a complicated thing. Both of them are valuable. And then he said, so it is with human societies and politics, right? So there's there are people you might call on the right of politics or the left of politics. Other people might be devoutly religious or they might not be religious and so on. There's all these different ways of looking at the world. And they're all valuable. It turns out it's like an electron. It's like you can't get a complete picture of a civilization, of a society, without understanding that there are these th these different ways of thinking. There's the there's the idea in politics about the needs of the individual. You might say, well, I don't want to pay too much tax. I want to work hard and I want as much money as I can. To... Or you might say, well, there's, but there's a society and that needs me to pay my taxes and there's a social structure. And and the same with with with them. Um, you know, belief. The you know, what's our response to this great mystery of existence? Some people might say, well. It's just physics. We just do that and we'll just, and some people might say, no, there's, there's, there's a spiritual dimension and, and, and I feel that there's more to it. All these things are necessary. They're not to be, it's not, even, it's not a compromise to say that I understand all these positions are necessary. It's, it's like, say, it's, it would be like saying it's a compromise to say, that, well, the, the, the, the electron, it's not really wavy and it's not really a point. That's not a compromise. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, you have to. It's a yeah. different picture. And so I, I've sort of stopped in many ways trying to, I, I don't know, I've tried to be more conciliatory. I've realized that for me, the world is divided into people of goodwill and people not of goodwill. That's what I think now. So, yeah. yeah. That, but I think that, uh, so I think that. I think, I think the more you deal with people, you more, uh, that outcome becomes more clear to people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it all comes down to intent and goodwill after after a point because uh, you have seen enough people, you have seen enough opinions, and after that, you are accustomed to all of those. Now, the only big separator is basically goodwill and and and intent, really. Uh, so I feel I feel that if if I'm uh, being honest, yeah, uh, but in the I just want to so, say Feynman, Feynman yeah, yeah, yeah, wrote a very similar mm -hmm. essay, same time, called "The Value of Science," and he said that the thing you learn from science is this: that um that the understanding that you don't know everything that that's that's very deep and important it's the it's the foundation of research you wouldn't do research if you think mm -hmm. you know everything but you have to you have to bring that into your life and it's quite difficult to do because you might believe yeah. something you know I, I you know i don't think brexit was a good idea for example right i <laughs> so, know yeah <laughs> i spent a lot of time sort of saying i think this is a bad idea uh, but <laughs> then recently i thought well what's the point of that you know i can what's the point of criticizing something that's happened and, and, and a load of people who in good yeah. faith voted for it because they thought it was a good thing to do so i'm kind of mellowing but not mellowing but understanding what Feynman meant what he, he really I meant it. when he said don't yeah. think you know the answer that is the key don't don't be so yeah. sure of your own position yeah. it's very hard yeah but it's yeah it is very hard you, you are the easiest person you can trick yourself you know uh you can trick yours so i mean uh, that is very and i think that's also one of the separation between uh, those groups you mentioned too you know scientists keep saying doubting yourself but when one side keeps saying we know everything how it happened this is how it happened uh, so i think that causes some friction too but i'm seeing some mellowing in the other uh, side too being more open to science more open to questioning so it is uh slowly uh becoming coming together and at this point i want to actually ask you uh someone 
as knowing, you know, how, what science brings us, what it teaches us, and the vastness of the universe, how do you find, uh, like, personal meaning and purpose? Because you mentioned your show has some philosophy to it, too. And um, how do we position ourselves? So uh, what advice would you give to others searching for the uh, same, like, this meaning and purpose in the context of such an immense you know mind-bogglingly big cosmos like where do we belong what did you come to find so far well i think that if you reflect on what you are so each of us what what are we um we are we're the most remarkable structures in the universe undoubtedly so it's not black holes or galaxies or planets or stars that are the most incredible things it is us because That's true we we can think you know i can't yeah. believe I, I think it was sagan who first said it that he said that he said a, a physicist is a hydrogen atom's way of understanding hydrogen atoms <laughs> which is <laughs> it's a yes. thing and and so i i think that somewhere in there in that the the the probable rarity of structures like us is the answer to that question if you reflect on it for a moment if you if you think, what are the chances of a load of atoms, the hydrogen from the Big Bang uh, are just after, and the carbon and everything from made of stars, stars all comes together in a dust cloud, and suddenly you're sat there thinking about things. If you think about that for a few seconds, I think a, at least a, a smile appears on your face. <laughs> it is pretty immense. If, so yeah, it's, it's an immense feeling, yeah. Is the answer. Yeah, that is that is pretty pretty profound, and I think uh, your the viewers, the audience will feel that as uh, they watch your show too, uh, which will be once again on uh, ap on April nineteenth at eight p.m. in Istanbul, and we will leave all the information down below, um, so you can get the final tickets, like I said, and hopefully, uh, Professor Cox uh, will enjoy his time in Istanbul too and maybe come back uh not oh, come too back. far from you know, it. I, I I promise you I mean as you said I didn't know what how the tickets if you can't get a ticket I will be back because there's one yes, thing for sure yeah. this is the thing about rock and roll promoters right because there's a rock and roll element to this as well if yeah. the show sells out you go back <laughs> yes there is a reason that it sells out so, and we have many other great cities too. So I can promote you Turkey a little. You can come to other cities like yeah. Ankara, Izmir, yeah. and other parts. So, uh, well, Professor Cox, I'd love to talk to with you for hours, but I know you're a busy man, and uh, this is our time. As a final note, though, uh, this is a big part of our um, existence too. For young people who are inspired by, by your work or other scientists' work, but feel overwhelmed, which I see a lot by the vastness of science, what advice would you give them to find the, their pa own path and contribute to our understanding of the universe? Because there's a lot of Turkish people who want to do this, but don't even know where to start, or they're just... Uh, you know, it's just so much to take in at once. Uh, what would you recommend uh, to them? It's it's a very good question. It's it's about small steps. So nobody, and, and Einstein said this himself, actually, Ch let's choose the most iconic scientist. Uh -huh. He said that, you know, it's, it's all about um, just being persistent. You start small. You just start trying to understand tiny things. And you'll find that if you really do it, you internalize that knowledge, you understand it, you'll have a strong foundation, you can go to the next bit. And, and you're right, there are many people, let's say you want to go to university, for example, we, I deal with this a lot in regions of the, of the UK as well. You, you, there are regions where, where someone, none of their family would have been to university, the, the grandparents, they won't know anyone who's, who's been, become a scientist. And so it feels impossible and daunting. What I would say is that all the universities in Turkey, and you, right, there are great universities in Turkey, and the international universities are so pleased if you if you contact them and say, you know, I, I have no idea how to do this. I'm really interested. What should I do? And they'll they'll help you. So it, it's it's a big problem that we have that we're losing a lot of great minds potentially. A lot of them, just because yeah. they're not coming, they're, they're not the, the background isn't right. They're not in the right place geographically, but there's there's a huge amount of of of work 
and and help and places institutions that would love to have you so my that's yeah. what would be my advice keep going Just don't as you said don't fool yourself that you understand something as you mentioned earlier you're the easiest mm -hmm. yes so keep going but also if you mm -hmm. need some help and reassurance it will be there you contact one of the great universities in istanbul they'll help you Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope that will give some inspiration to our viewers too. And uh, like you were saying, and I think Stephen Jay Gould said this, you know, I care less about the uh, the little parts of Einstein's brain, but I care more about how many Einsteins we are losing uh, in the sweatshops that we can't get to. So I think that's a common denominator for all science communicators trying to get to those people and inspire them. And um, not that, you know, uh, hard labor, everybody sh doesn't need to become a scientist, obviously, but those who have the potential but don't have the means to, a uh, means for it, I think uh, science communication is the most important way to get to them. Um, well, thank you so much for chatting with me today it was an amazing experience for me too and uh, good luck uh, in istanbul and and the rest of your show and uh, once again thank you so much thank you so much and, and well i see are you in are you in istanbul uh, i'm in dallas right now You're about in dallas? one hour north yeah I, I live in texas with my wife uh our our quote-unquote business is uh in is in the u.s but uh it's towards turkey i started this when i was in college and um uh, uh, now we're just uh continuing it and it's getting bigger and bigger so um we're trying to reach to as many people as possible and inspire them about science and uh yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully you'll come back to Dallas too soon I or said, any oh, part a, of Texas. That was a fun show. Was, I enjoyed it very much, actually. So I think it, it, yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, we were sitting all the way back because we were worried that our son would start crying. In the middle oh, yeah. of it. <laughs> so we would have to run out, not to disturb anyone. But he actually was quiet the whole time. So <laughs> that was a win. All right. All right thank nice you so much. You See you I, next I, time. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Evet, gerçekten muhteşem bir insan Brian Cox ve keşke saatlerimiz olsaydı da daha ona sorabileceğim tabii ki birçok soru vardı. Özellikle de bilimle ilgili çok fazla konuya girmek istemedim çünkü girecek olsaydık hani spesifik bilim konuları işte kara delikler e, ne bileyim atom altı parçacıklar falan. E, bu defa başka bu yayın boyunca sorduğum soruları soramayacaktım o yüzden birazcık bu ayarda tutmak istedim e, ama yayında da az önce konuştuğumuz gibi bu konuya bir ilgi olduğu belli olduğu için Türkiye'de ki e, şu ana kadar bilet alan herkese bu yüzden özellikle teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Çünkü bu mesajı verebilmek çok önemli bu tür insanlara. Bakın bizde bu konuya bir açlık, bir merak var. Bize yaptığınız şeyleri, ürettiğiniz şeyleri getirin diyebilmemiz gerçekten çok önemli. Çünkü Türkiye'de ilham verebileceği gençlerin sayısı akıl almaz. Ve bunu bu şovu gören insanların e, büyüdükleri zaman... Bize neler katacaklarını şimdiden öngörebilmemiz mümkün bile değil. O yüzden e, bu tür şovlara ilgi göstermemiz, eğer bütçemiz el veriyorsa destek olmamız, e, bilet almamız gerçekten çok önemli. Ve umuyorum ki bu gösterdiğimiz ilgi sayesinde sadece Brian Cox değil, dünyadaki bütün bilim iletişimcileri, bütün bilim insanları Türkiye'de de şov yapmak isteyecekler. Türkiye'de de kendi e, eğitim programlarını, kendi çalışmalarını getirmek isteyecekler. Ve bu bilgi transferi sayesinde biz bir yerlere e, ulaşabileceğiz. Onun üzerine katarak, yani Newton'un dediği gibi başka kendisinden önce gelenlerin omuzlarında yükselerek e, bir yerlere ulaşacağız. Bilim böyledir. Kolektif bir uğraştır ve Brian Cox bize bu değerli vaktini ayırarak bugün çok özel bir şey yaptı. Umuyorum siz de keyifle izlemişsinizdir. Evrim Ağacı olarak Türkiye'deki bilim iletişimi çalışmalarımıza hız kesmeden hatta hız katarak e, ilerlemek istiyoruz. Eğer bunları faydalı buluyorsanız bu tür e, değerli insanlarla yaptığımız çalışmaları daha profesyonel bir şekilde yapabilmek, onların yaşadığı ülkelere gidip oralarda röportajlar yapmamızı belki size bunları getirebilmemizi isterseniz e, Patreon, Kriosus veya basitçe YouTube katıl tuşu üzerinden bize destek olabilirsiniz. Yayın boyunca yaptığınız destekler için de gerçekten çok teşekkür ederim. Şimdi her birinin üstünden geçemeyeceğim ama e, gerçekten çok anlamlı bizim için. E, umuyorum tüm izleyicilerimiz için faydalı olmuştur ve umuyorum Brian Cox'un şovu bende yarattığı gibi sizde de derinden bir e, etki bırakacaktır sizin üzerinizde. 
Ee, bir sonraki canlı yayınımızda veya videomuzda görüşmek üzere. İyi ki varsınız. İyi ki bugünkü yayınımıza katıldınız. Ee, bir sonraki videoda görüşmek üzere. Hoşçakalın arkadaşlar.